Kubernetes is great, but not for stateful applications. Do not run databases in Kubernetes. Have you heard those statements before? Have you? Do you think that they're true? Let's see. Do not run databases in Kubernetes is a valid sentence, but only when pronounced by those who either do not understand how Kubernetes works or those who manage to invent a time machine and still live in the past. Both cases boil down to the same thing. In the past, during the early days, we relied almost exclusively on the primitives available in Kubernetes. That means that we had to choose between deployments and stateful sets to run our workloads. Deployments were designed for stateless and stateful set, as the name suggests, for stateful applications. As a result, people came to a logical conclusion that databases should run as stateful sets. That was a mistake. To be more precise, it was a mistake to think that workloads should be managed by either of those two primitives, especially stateful applications. You see, Kubernetes is an extensible platform. What comes packaged in the core Kubernetes is more of a reference implementation than a complete solution. Kubernetes is not a platform we should use. It is a base platform that should be extended to meet our needs. Take a look at networking. We do not use networking provided by Kubernetes. We use CNI plugins to extend Kubernetes networking capabilities. We pick the one that makes sense for our use case, like Cilium or Calico. We do not use storage available in Kubernetes. We use storage provided by CSI plugins. You might not even be aware of that if you're using a managed Kubernetes service like EKS or AKS or GK, but trust me when I say that those have CSI and CNI plugins installed. The same applies to databases, except that there is no standard interface for databases. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go back to stateful sets. Few of us who were brave enough to run databases in Kubernetes used stateful sets. Or maybe saying brave is not accurate enough. Foolish would be a better word. I'll get back to the reasons why we were foolish. Stateful sets provide a few important features that differentiate them from deployments. To begin with, stateful sets provide predictable order and state for stateful applications. While deployments scale up and down randomly, stateful sets scale up and down in a predictable order. If a deployment scales up, a new pod is created. If it scales down, a random pod is deleted. That's all cool, that's all dandy for stateless applications, but not for stateful ones. Stateful sets do not do that. Pods are indexed and they're created and deleted in a specific order. That means that we can, for example, assign the first replica as the primary node of a database cluster, knowing that it will not be removed if the cluster scales down. And when I say cluster, I mean database cluster, not cluster cluster. Another major difference is the stateful sets provide stable network identifiers and persistent storage. While all replicas of a deployment get the same persistent storage, each replica of a stateful set gets its own private, personal persistent storage. That's important since it would be silly for all replicas of a database to share the same storage. That would make the database cluster explode and leave us with ashes and tears. Also, persistent volumes storage attached to pods created through a stateful set is, are actually persistent. If a specific pod goes down and a new one is created in its place, the same volume will be attached to it. The new replica will have the same data as the one that failed. The similar can be said when a replica is deleted as, let's say, a result of an upgrade, for example. Finally, replicas, pods of a stateful set get stable network identifiers, which is also important for databases, especially in cases when data needs to be distributed across nodes. 
pods created through a deployment get random names, or to be more precise, names fit random suffixes. That means that services that point to pods created through a deployment have no choice but to randomize traffic by distributing it across all pods. I mean, I know that that's not 100% true. We can fix that somehow with service meshes and what's not, but that's the gist of it, right? Now, that makes a lot of sense. Is That's typically what we want with stateless applications. Distribute more or less evenly traffic across all the replicas. We cannot, or to be more precise, shouldn't do that with databases. With databases, we need to know which replica is the primary one and which replicas are the secondary ones. We get that with stateless sets since pod or replica names are predictable. Each has a numbered suffix starting with, there we go, zero. That means that we can, for example, declare a pod suffixed as zero, as the primary one, and all others as secondary ones. Now, you can probably guess that wouldn't work, but that's the idea of it, right? Now, there are a few other differences, but you probably get the point. Replicas of a deployment are unpredictable, while those of a stateful set are predictable. It's chaos versus order. Stateless likes chaos, stateful likes order. Keeping all that in mind, a logical conclusion would be to use stateful sets to run databases, right? Wrong. The fact that a stateful set is a better choice than a deployment does not mean that it is a good choice. It only means that it is a slightly better option among bad choices. There are many other things we need to run databases successfully in production. We need backups, failovers and promotions, observability, and so on and so forth. Just putting a database designed to run on fixed servers into a container image and running it in Kubernetes as a stateful set is not enough. Hence, many said Kubernetes is not ready for databases. But using stateful sets to run databases is not the only option. It might have been the only option in the past during very, very early days of Kubernetes, but not anymore. For a while now, it is clear that we need to extend Kubernetes with custom resource definitions backed by custom controllers, and databases are not an exception. Today, I will go as far as to say not only that we can run databases in Kubernetes, but that Kubernetes is now the best platform to run databases. Actually, that statement is not entirely true. So let me rephrase it. Kubernetes is now the best platform to run databases only if you use custom resource definitions backed by custom controllers or operators. Fortunately, there are many operators available for many databases, and today we are going to take a look at one of my favorites. So let's see how we should run databases in Kubernetes. Today we'll run PostgreSQL in Kubernetes using cloud native PG project. Let's take a look at cluster YAML that I prepared. That's a good definition of my PostgreSQL cluster. So it's a custom resource based on custom resource definition that comes from cloud native PG. The kind is cluster, and I have a spec that says, hey, I would like to have three instances of my database. I want primary update strategy to be unsupervised, meaning upgraded without additional confirmations whenever I choose to do so. Storage is going to be one gigabyte and monitoring should be, as you can guess, enabled, right? Otherwise, how can you run a database without monitoring what's happening, right? Now, let's see what I got. And I will start by executing kubecat on a name. I want to get all the clusters. In this context, because many things can be called cluster, I mean uh, PostgreSQL clusters. And you can see that I have a cluster called Silly Demo. Right now, there is only one instance. There will be more, because I said I want three. And you can see the status says, I'm setting up the primary node, the primary instance. Now, if I output pods, you will see that there is one pod. Again, there will be more, because each instance of my database will be pod. But what happens if I say something like, hey, give me all the stateful sets? 
none, at least not in that namespace, right? So this is not managed by a stateful set. This is managed directly by a cloud native PG controller, which takes similar but widely extended responsibilities as stateful set that is baked into Kubernetes, right? So we are letting cloud native PG controller to manage everything, including the pods, instead of them being managed by stateful sets, right? Now, I can list all the services. Those are the addresses through which we can communicate with our database. And you can see that there are three. One is read, the other one is read as well. And uh, the final one, that's the one we should use. RW is the one we can use to write something to the database. Now, if I want to connect to the database, I can output all the secrets. There are quite a few of them. The one that you should be using, the one that your application should be using is the one that ends with APP. Now, if I re-execute kubectl get clusters, you can see that now there are three instances. While I was talking, additional two were created. Two of them are ready, it's still creating the three. Third one, I will let it do the job and see what else I can find out. And what I can find out is the status of all the information, all the whatever is happening with my database by going through Grafana. See, apart from installing the database itself, the, not the database, the Cloud Native PG controllers, I also installed Prometheus and Grafana, and I used a helper manifest from Cloud Native PG to get very specific dashboard that applies only to that project. So everything is already set up. And if you want to reproduce what I'm doing, there's a gist with the links in the description. So go ahead and do it. I skipped the setup. Anyways, going back to Grafana, let me log in with my username and very, very secret password. And if I go to dashboards, you can see that there is Cloud Native PG dashboard. And this one has all the information that you might or might not need. Everything you need to know about your database is here. The database is managed by Cloud Native PG. And I also on top of that have dashboard that contains all the information. I will not even attempt to go through explanation of what all that information means. Everything is there. And if you're confused, then maybe you shouldn't be using uh, PostgreSQL because you need to understand how it works. Anyways, everything you need is over there, right? Now, I showed you a very, very simple example of Cloud Native PG uh, manifest with only four, five, six fields, like hey, three replicas, three instances, and so on and so forth. Um, here is a more complex example. I'm not going to go through it. I just wanted you to see that things can get much more complicated because all the tweaks, all the levers you need to run database and to manage that database or database cluster is available through that custom resource definition that you can use to create custom resources like the one you see on the screen right now. Now, I had my initial intention was to show you many different features and variations and all the things we can do with PostgreSQL. But then I realized that this video would take hours and you probably do not have so much patience. So instead of me showing you all the different features, I'm going to read all the features that it has. Are you ready? Three, two, one. Direct integration with Kubernetes API server for high availability without requiring an external tool. Self-healing capability. Planned switchover of the primary instance by promoting a selected replica. Scale up and down capabilities. Definition of an arbitrary number of instances. Definition of the read-write service to connect your application to the only primary server of the cluster. Definition of the read-only service to connect your applications to any of the instances for reading workloads. Declarative management of PostgreSQL configuration, including certain popular Postgres boring. Declarative management of Postgres roles, users, and groups. Support for local persistent volumes with PVC templates, reuse of persistent volume storage in pods, separate volume for WAL files, rolling updates for PostgreSQL minor versions, in place or rolling updates for operator upgrades, TLS connections and client certificate authentication 
authentication, support for custom TLS certificates, continuous backup to an object store, full recovery and point-in-time recovery, offline import of existing PostgreSQL databases, fencing of an entire PostgreSQL cluster, hibernation of a PostgreSQL cluster, support for synchronous replicas, support for HA physical replication slots, uh, backup from a standby, backup retention policies, parallel WLL archiving and restore uh, to allow database to keep up with the lab, doesn't matter. Support tagging backup files uploaded somewhere. Uh, PostgreSQL deployments across multiple Kubernetes clusters. Connection pooling with the PG Bouncer. Support for node affinity with node selector, native customizable exporter of something. Standard output logging of PostgreSQL error messages in JSON format, automatically set read-only root file system security context for pods, plugin for Kube Cuttle, simple bind and search bind, the LDAP client authentication and multi-arc format container images. And here is the question for you. How would you accomplish those tasks by running a database as a stateful set only? Now, you might answer that question by saying, I would do those in the same ways I've been doing them before moving to Kubernetes. Is that the case? If it is, Kubernetes is certainly not a good choice to run databases, at least not for you. When we adopt Kubernetes, we are adopting its API. We are adopting a certain way of doing things. We are adopting the ecosystem that assumes that workloads are defined in a certain way. If you are not willing to adopt that way of doing things, we should not adopt Kubernetes. The point is that Kubernetes is the best platform to run databases but only if you go beyond the primitives available in core Kubernetes and if you are willing to embrace its way of working. That's why we need operators, custom resource definitions, and controllers. That's why we need to extend Kubernetes to enable running specific tasks and workloads. That's why we need cloud native BG. The main question you have to ask yourself is whether you want a managed or self-managed database. If you choose the former, your cloud provider already has a solution for you. That could be RDS in AWS, Cloud SQL in Google Cloud, or Azure Database for PostgreSQL. This is not the time nor the place for me to start the debate whether you should use a managed database or not. What I can say, though, is that if you choose to use a self-managed database, Kubernetes is the right choice. And among all the options, Cloud Native PG is one of the best, if not the best solution we have today when PostgreSQL is concerned. It is proven to run well in production, it is robust, and it provides most, if not all, of the features you might need. It is a sure bet, especially since it is an open source project and it was submitted to CNCF or incubation. When it gets accepted, it will be the first PostgreSQL project in CNCF. By the time you watch this video, it might already be accepted. Honestly, I cannot find any serious cons for Cloud Native PG beyond those that apply to all self-managed databases and the fact that self-managing a database of any kind, including Cloud Native PG, including PostgreSQL, is not a trivial task and it requires a lot of knowledge and experience. That being said, if you do prefer to use a self-managed database, and that database should be PostgreSQL, as it should, Cloud Native PG is a great option. Probably the, no, not probably, the best option. Oh, and I almost forgot, there is an enterprise version with additional features, support provided by EDB, check them out. So if you're an enterprise company that wants enterprise support, you know how to call. They are there. All in all, give Cloud Native PG a try. Use it. Let me know what you think and what's your experience with it. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Cheers.